thank you Anirudh for the introduction. I am Suraj Jog and today I am here to talk about our work on enabling IoT self-localization using ambient 5G signals. So the number of IoT devices in our lives are exploding and they are being used for a number of different applications like smart city monitoring where you want to track logs and other issues in the sewage system for example. In many applications for data driven agriculture like real time livestock monitoring or water flow for irrigation and even smart factory automation where you want to do inventory tracking and so on. Surveys estimate that the number of deployed IoT devices will grow to about 31 billion by 2030. And given such ubiquitous deployment of these devices, the ability to track and localize them accurately is going to be really important. Past work typically uses GPS as the most common outdoors localization technique today. But the issue with GPS is that it can be very power hungry. In fact, studies have shown that GPS can consume almost the same power as your entire IoT device. And it also comes with extra hardware costs. As a result, in the past researchers have tried to use cellular networks or dedicated IoT base stations to localize devices. However, either they achieve very low resolution uh, accuracy and are only good for coarse grained estimates or they require active participation of the base stations to jointly localize the device for which you first need to synchronize the base stations tightly with each other. As a result, these solutions are not easy to implement in practice because now you require the cellular company to go and modify the base stations to support localization. So in this work, the question that we are interested in is, can the IoT device accurately localize itself? First, by only listening to ambient 5G signals in the air and second, without coordinating or without making any modifications to your base stations. This aspect of ambient localization is really important for the scalability aspect of the system because we expect the number of deployed IoT devices to be much much more than the number of base stations. So with ambient localization, your base stations now don't need to allocate dedicated time frequency blocks to localize these devices. In addition, you also have that 5G gives you some very unique opportunities for, for high accuracy localization. First, the small cell architecture in 5G is going to lead to a very dense deployment of base stations which means you can use more anchor points for better accuracy. And second, 5G packets can, scan, uh, can span very large bandwidths up to 100 megahertz in the sub 6 gigahertz and up to 400 megahertz in the millimeter wave frequency band. And what high bandwidth gives you is very high resolution in time of light which in turn translates to very high accuracy localization. So to show you how this helps us, let's consider this scenario here where you have a base station and a 5G compatible device. You have one line of sight path at 11 meters and two environmental reflectors at 15 and 39 meters. So when your mobile device captures the large bandwidth 5G packet and it translates the information from the packet to the time of flight domain, it can give you information about the distance traveled by each path in your environment. So for instance, one path at 11 meters, one at 15 and one at 39 meters. And because the large bandwidth has given you such high resolution in time of light, you can actually separate out all the paths here and estimate the distance for each path accurately. And as a result, now I can isolate just the line of sight path and use the line of sight path information from multiple base stations to accurately localize myself. However, the challenge is that leveraging the same opportunities on low cost IoT devices is not easy. And this is because IoT devices are typically equipped with low speed and uh, low cost ADCs. ADCs are analog to digital converters and they can only capture a very narrow bandwidth of the packet. They can't capture the, uh, the entire 100 megahertz. So for instance, in our experiments, the IoT device captures 16 times smaller bandwidth. So only this 100 by 16 uh, megahertz chunk of the spectrum here. And this in turn means 
that the time of flight resolution is also going to be 16 times worse. So in this case, if the IoT device tried to compute the time of flight information, you lose out on all the resolution and you can see that all of the paths just simply merge into one big peak. As a result, you can no longer accurately estimate the time of flight for, each of the, for any of the underlying paths. But this is not the only issue, right? Because our goal is ambient localization. And the time of flight that you're estimating from these 5G packets are always going to be corrupted by synchronization offsets between your base station and the IoT device. So the point is that it is not possible to get accurate, to get absolute time of flight measurements from only one-way packet measurements. So in this work, we present Isla, where the goal is to enable IoT self-localization using ambient 5G signals. And we need to solve both of these previous challenges to enable Isla. So the first component is, how do you capture large bandwidth 5G signals on narrow band devices? And second, after you have recovered the high resolution time of flight from such packets, how do you use that to localize the IoT device without coordinating with the base stations? In this talk, I'll mainly focus on the first component of this work, but I'm happy to go into the details and take questions about the second component at the end as well. All right, so how do you capture large bandwidth signals on a narrow band device? To do this, we are going to leverage something called MEMS acoustic resonators, which allows us to build new kinds of RF filters. So traditionally, with RF filters, you typically have low pass filters, which keep the low frequencies and filter out high frequencies, or you have high pass filters, which keep the high frequencies, filter out low frequencies, or you have band pass filters, which keep the frequencies within a certain band. But with MEMS filters, now we can create these new kinds of filters that are RF spike train filters. So as you can see here on the right, it looks like a periodic spike train in the frequency domain. And here is the image of the filter under a microscope. And what this filter now allows you to do is, it allows you to keep tiny portions of the frequency across the entire bandwidth. So this is something new that we can do with RF filters. And let me show you how we are going to use something like this for our localization goals. So, okay, as I mentioned, the goal is large block of bandwidth, but IoT device only gives a small block of bandwidth. So how do we get around this? So to work around this, at the first step, we will pass the large bandwidth 5G signal through the spike train filter. And as a result, the spike train filter only allows frequencies that align with your spikes to pass. And if you look at this, this is almost as if we took samples of the signal in the frequency domain. That is, we subsample the signal in the frequency domain, essentially. And when we do that, you can see that the signal also becomes sparse in the frequency domain. Now, if you are uh, familiar with sparse recovery or uh, compressive sensing, this should probably ring a bell that sparse recovery tells us that if your signal is sparse in the frequency domain, then you can still recover it even if you subsample it below the Nyquist rate of that signal. So over here, if I were to take my IoT device that's sampling this large bandwidth signal 16 times below its Nyquist rate, what would happen? What would happen is we would get something called aliasing in the frequency domain. What aliasing means is that you originally started with this large 100 megahertz signal, but you sampled it 16 times below the Nyquist rate of the 100 megahertz signal. So you're left with only this tiny 100 by 16 megahertz portion shown here and all the frequencies that were outside the narrow band in the original signal, they alias and map into some position inside your narrow band. And this process is called aliasing. And this aliased spectrum is what you observe on your IoT device. So our goal is, given this alias spectrum, we want to recover back the original large bandwidth spectrum. And once we get that, we can also use it to recover back the high resolution time of flight information. An important point to note here is that this, it's not only that it gives us high time of flight resolution, in fact, it gives us the exact same, uh, I'm sorry, it gives us the exact same resolution 
as if you had an entire 100 megahertz packet to begin with. And this is because your resolution in time of light at the end of the day depends only on the end-to-end -end measurements of your channel in the frequency domain. And it doesn't require you to have every single frequency measurement in this bandwidth. So, of course, in being, so this is the key intuition for how we capture wide bandwidth on narrow band devices. There are, of course, a lot of system level and algorithmic challenges in getting this to work. And one of the main challenges for us was at the sparse recovery step. So, typically, the main problem is that when you have aliasing, different frequencies may collide when they alias. So, they essentially fall on top of each other and add up in your alias spectrum. And you can't recover either of the colliding frequencies now. Past work typically leverages co-prime subsampling factors to be able to resolve these collisions. But in our case, we can't really do that. And that is due to the structure of the 5G packet. So 5G packets use something called OFDM modulation. Now, if you don't know OFDM, that's fine. But essentially what it means is that OFDM divides the large bandwidth of your packet into n smaller frequency sub-channels and it encodes information on each of these sub-channels. And it also makes sure that each of these sub-channels are orthogonal, which gives you good spectral efficiency in communications. What we proved in the paper is that if you subsample your large bandwidth 5G signal by anything that is not a proper factor of n, then you lose this orthogonality when your signal aliases. And when you lose orthogonality, you're no longer able to recover the high resolution time of light. Uh, we have a detailed proof showing this in the paper and uh, I'll just state it here and not get into the details of the proof. But essentially, and, and there's a bigger problem here, right? Because in 5G and typically most cellular standards, the number of sub-channels in the OFDM packet is typically defined to be a power of two. So 512, 1024 and so on. And this means we can subsample the signal only by multiples of two. So 2, 4, 8, 16 and so on. And as a result, co-prime subsampling is not an option for us. So how do we get around this? Our main idea is that instead of trying to control the subsampling factor itself, let us carefully design the MEMS filter such that we can avoid collisions altogether in the very first place. So essentially, the problem is that given this structure of a filter, a uniform spike train filter, what should the shape of the filter be that can guarantee us zero collisions upon aliasing? So again, I, uh, we have a proof in the paper that shows what the exact parameters of this filter need to be. And I'll just show you what the filter is. And I can get into the details of why this is the right filter at the end of the talk. So the bandwidth of the filter spans B megahertz, which is 100 megahertz in our example. And the IoT device is subsampling the signal by 16 times. And the parameters of the MEMS filter that we can control are the spacing between the spikes, the width of each spike, and the starting frequency of the first spike. And in the paper, we prove that if you set these parameters as this particular function of the bandwidth and the subsampling factor, you can ensure that there are zero collisions when your IoT device subsamples this signal by P. So, uh, okay, so let, uh, let me also quickly close the loop. Uh, so, so this is the first part of the paper, that is how do you capture large bandwidth on narrow band devices. Let me quickly close the loop on how we actually do localization because there are synchronization errors that we need to deal with. And to get around this, we essentially leverage two antennas on the IoT device such that we can convert this problem from time of flight localization to differential time of flight localization. And the intuition is that your synchronization errors are going to be constant across the two antennas on the IoT device, so you can just difference them out. All right, so moving on to the results and the uh, test bed that we built. So here is the spike train filter that we uh, fabricated uh, along with our collaborators who work in circuits. And this is the frequency response that is based on the ideal filter parameters that I had shown you earlier. And if you subsample the signal by 16, this is the aliasing pattern that you can see here. As I had mentioned, one of the key contributions in this paper was we want to design this filter such that we can ensure zero collisions. And you can see that here, right? Because 
your spikes are not overlapping on top of each other, you can actually extract the channel measurements very cleanly from this alias spectrum. And now the sparse recovery problem is essentially equivalent to just rearranging where the frequencies originally aliased from. And once you do that, you can also get accurate time of flight measurement from this. So we took this filter and uh, we built a prototype circuit and a prototype base station to run experiments with. And uh, we evaluated Isla in a bunch of different test beds, ranging from a campus test bed that had a lot of surrounding buildings and a lot of multipath, a stadium parking lot and a huge uh, agricultural cornfield because where else in Illinois would we run experiments? This is the, what the main results of our system looks like. Uh, so over here, you can see that we are comparing the IoT device's localization with and without Isla. And without Isla, the IoT device captures only a narrow bandwidth. So it has very poor resolution in time of flight and gives you poor localization as well in, uh, in turn. IoT with Isla on the other hand, can sense large bandwidth, despite the fact that it, that it is using the same cheap hardware. And as a result, it can improve the localization performance by 3.35 times, despite the fact it's using the same speed ADC. We also compare it against the upper bound baseline, where you essentially have a full 100 megahertz receiver that can capture the entire large bandwidth signal. And you can see that the performance of the full 100 megahertz receiver is close to that of Isla. So we so we run these uh, uh, experiments across all three test beds and we can see that Isla has similar performance across all our different experiments. And the key point to take away here is that Isla's performance is very close to having a 100 megahertz receiver despite the fact that Isla's hardware is operating at 16 times lower rates compared to this full 100 megahertz receiver. So finally, as takeaways, Isla enables IoT devices to self-localize themselves accurately using only ambient 5G signals and without requiring any coordination. Isla can enable narrowband devices to, send wide uh, to sense wideband channel and thus it can achieve performance close to as if you had a completely uh, broadband uh, receiver. And finally, these MEMS spike train filters can be leveraged to enable a lot of new applications on these IoT devices because the core functionality that is giving you, it is allowing you to stretch the effective bandwidth on IoT devices. And in fact, there are a lot of applications that this can be used for, some of which we ourselves have worked in the past where we've used these filters for uh, spectrum sensing, wideband spectrum sensing to detect channel occupancy. Thank you so much for staying till the end of the talk and uh, I'm happy to take questions. As a final note, uh, I am on the job market this year and uh, you can reach me at this email ID and I hope this talk convinces you to uh, invite me for interviews.